Well, welcome everybody to this exciting virtual SciFest Africa webinar, which is entitled The Uniqueness of South Africa's Plant Diversity and the Role of Botanical Gardens in Plant Conservation. This is part of the overall theme, Take Root, Nurture, and a contribution to the International Year of Plant Health. I'm gonna start by making some introductory comments and then I'll introduce our panelists, Susie, Donovan and William, and ask them questions. And all participants are welcome to submit questions through your own Q&A function or through the comment function if you're joining us on Facebook. And we will try to answer them during the course of the next hour or so. But let's start with a few basic points that introduce the theme. As you know, South Africa is a very dry country, it's only about 0.38% of its total surface area covered by water. For in, by contrast, India has almost 10% of water uh, coverage. Yet South Africa harbors over an astonishing 20,000 species of plants, which is about 10% of all the plants in the world. And what's more, about 65% of those plants are endemic. However, our plants are in trouble. About 14% of them are listed as threatened and over 11% as of on conservation concern. If we look at the 440 uh, vegetation types in South Africa, the situation is even worse. 5% are critically endangered, 12% endangered and 16% vulnerable to extinction, which adds up to a frighteningly high total of 33% or one third in all the categories. Of course, one of our plant gems is the Cape Floral Kingdom, one of only six floral kingdoms in the world. And although it's the smallest, it supports the highest diversity of plants with over 9,000 species, 70% of which are endemic. In addition, South Africa has three biodiversity hotspots. In addition to the Cape Floristic region, we have the succulent Karoo and the Maputland Pondaland uh, Albany hotspot. Many critically important habitats in these floral kingdoms and hotspots are severely threatened by human development. There's five main causes of biodiversity loss and it's easy to remember them because the first letter spells the acronym HIPPO. They are habitat destruction, invasive plants and animals, pollution, population growth by humans and overexploitation. And we can add a C on the end now with the addition of climate change. Now the important thing about plants, of course, is that they're not just pretty flowers. Together with microorganisms, they are the engine room of the natural world, producing food and providing vital services from the base of the food pyramid. The loss of plant diversity therefore has very serious consequences not only for human society and our economy, but especially for essential ecological processes and the other 9 million plus inhabitants with which we share the planet. Large portions of our economy are heavily dependent on plant diversity, such as horticulture and agriculture based on indigenous plants, game and livestock ranching, commercial and subsistence use of medicinal plants and ecotourism. Furthermore, the majority of South Africans are highly dependent on natural resources, especially plants, for their livelihoods and well-being. About 70% of us use medicinal plants as our primary source of health care. In addition, natural ecosystems dominated by plants play a vital role in providing cost-effective resilience against the impact of climate change. A recent estimate placed the total value added to the economy by functioning natural systems in South Africa, excluding the marine environment, as 73 billion rand per annum, which is about 7% of our GDP. So plant conservation is not just a nice to have, it is an essential part of our modern lives. Now I'd like to introduce our three panelists. First, firstly, Prof. Susie Vetter is an ecologist in the Botany Department at Rhodes University. Her research interests are interdisciplinary and include vegetation change, bush encroachment, rangeland dynamics, and the cultural importance of biodiversity. 
while her work is based on fundamental research on vegetation dynamics and human environment interactions, it also has a strong applied dimension that informs policy and management. Our second panelist's name is Bond, William Bond. He is a professor in biological sciences at UCT who has served as a chief scientist um, for the South African Environmental Observation Network, SION, and is an ecologist with broad interest in the processes that influence vegetation change, including fire, plant eating, atmospheric uh, carbon dioxide, and climate change. He has also worked on plant animal mutualisms and on plant form and function, and has a particular interest in grassland savannas and winter rainfall shrublands. Our last panelist is Dr. Donovan Kirkwood, who received a PhD in ecology from UCT in 2003 and initially worked as a protected areas and landscape ecologist for Cape Nature before moving into spatial analysis and mapping to support protected area and land use planning. Ongoing habitat loss and degradation, despite excellent policy, legislation, and spatial plans, led him to make a career change. And in 2018, he became curator of the Stellenbosch University Botanical Garden. In this capacity, he hopes to showcase um, our diversity and support research and species conservation, and hoping that this will be a more effective approach to addressing the accelerating um, extinction crisis. So those are our three panelists. And now let's go on to question time. Susie, I'd like to start with you. Your work includes both fundamental research and informing policy making and management. How important do you think it is for scientists to adopt this cross-disciplinary approach? Um, well, the reason we do science for most of us, I think is just a deep curiosity about how the natural world works. But if we're the only ones, we and our scientific peers are the only ones who ever know about it, I think the world at large really misses out. They're also the ones who fund our research. And when we apply for our funding, we always argue that it's to the benefit of humankind. So I think, I don't think everybody needs to straddle applied and fundamental in their actual research, but I think it's becoming increasingly important for those cross-disciplinary, cross-fundamental applied collaborations to happen and communications to happen so that that fundamental research, which many of us love doing, also serves society and the persistence of our plant diversity. So you see your involvement in policy making and management as one way of sharing your knowledge and basically paying back the taxpayer. One hopes so. It's not always easy. Um, doing the science is often by far the easier and more fun part. But I actually got into science, well, after doing my BSc, I was convinced I was going to go into rural development. And I traveled and did that for a while and came back to study further with that aim in mind. So that's kind of how I ended up in academia. So it has been a big interest of mine from before. William, you're also well known for working at the interface of disciplines. How important do you think it is for a, a scientist to have an, a holistic approach to research on plants and their conservation and management? I'm not sure what context you mean by holistic, but uh, at least in my realm of ecology, um, it was essential to consider animals. So I've always loathed entomology, um, but and tried to dodge it when I was at university. Then ended up studying seed dispersal by ants in Famos, and the ants were critical to uh, understanding the system. Then I worked to, in savannas, and uh, if you work in savannas and ignore the bigger hairies, the large mammals, you're, you'll be blind to a major part uh, of how Africa works. Um, so, and then now, more recently, I've become more aware of uh, the scale. And the more and more ecologists are beginning to look at the global scale. 
this, the ecology of the planet. And uh, this is the ultimate at the moment, the holistic. A holistic system includes the whole planet and it's remarkable. It's absolutely fascinating. It serves all the curiosity needs and it also serves the direct needs of, of everyone. Um, if we're going to continue to uh, somehow live on this planet. So yeah, holism is, is a good idea. <laughs> but uh, yes. A more global approach, I presume, is facilitated by the digital age, where we have supercomputers and human brains basically talking to one another, and we're able to share knowledge in an unprecedented way. Yeah, the, I first became aware of it through the use of satellites and uh, the identification of the ozone hole and the recognition that that was linked to a human intervention, which is chlorofluorocarbons. Uh, that was the first suggestion. Um, it was the first discovery of the planet and the planetary ecology and uh, the need for us to start managing our whole blooming planet. Fascinating. And then since then, as you, you rightly say, uh, huge quantities of data, uh, stretching the limits of a human brain to deal with and the development of artificial intelligence to cope with that and to stream it down to something that's manageable. But without the human mind, uh, we lost. We have to um, be knowledgeable, uh, insightful, darn clever, uh, to before we get completely drowned by the data and do the wrong thing. Okay, we'll come back to that. Let me ask Donovan. Donovan, you switched careers to become a curator of a botanical garden in order to do work that you regard as more important for plant conservation and awareness. Are you more comfortable now that you're achieving those objectives? <laughs> I wouldn't say more important. Um... Uh, I just felt like in my previous uh, role, A, it was getting a little depressing. Uh, as a spatial mapper, you essentially are routinely exposed to just tracking loss. Uh, you're just seeing the landscape eroding in front of you and seeing ecosystems falling apart left, right and center. Um, and uh, I was kind of at a juncture where I was either going to get more and more hysterical and depressed about that or I could try and uh, transition into something a little more positive. Um, so I don't believe it's more important, uh, but it's a different, uh, it's a different strategy to, to tackle the same thing. Um, and whether we're achieving that, uh, it's very much baby steps. So our garden in particular is a very little one. Um, and I think the, the, uh, one would have to delve quite strongly into what it is that we're trying to do in terms of our strategy to examine that, but it's, it's very early days. Okay, thank you. Well, let's go on to the general questions and every each of the panelists should feel free to respond. My first question is a very general one, and that is how valuable and unique is plant diversity in South Africa? Who'd like to start? William? I think you've already started by pointing out that something like two thirds of the plant species here occur only in this country. Uh, we, we are amongst the world's richest, um, we are the world's richest area for plants outside the tropics. It, it, it is just an extraordinary country. Um, and it's not, Australia has a lot of diversity, but Australia is, I hate to say this if there are any Australians there, but remarkably monotonous. It's a repetition of the same themes of eucalypts and acacias and proteas across the whole continent. South Africa is phenomenal. You have uh, the Cape diversity, the, the famous flora, you have the succulent flora, stunning in the Macquarie in spring. If you've never seen it, go and see it. You have the grasslands, um, our savannas, the forests, uh, different kinds of forests, the thickets of the Eastern Cape, each one has an entirely different suite of species and an entirely different ecology. It's, a, it's an absolute paradise if you're interested in nature. There's something I always try to keep in mind is when we talk about a species, we're not just talking about 
the morphology, the structure of an animal or a plant. To me, a species is everything that it does and can do, all its ecological relationships with other species. In other words, it's niche. And you know that's when we look at plants and we look at animals, I really think it's important to keep that in mind. Donovan? I think a um, couple of things. I, I suspect that certainly, you know, one of the nice things about being in an academic space again is one is exposed to uh, some of a broad range of work. And it seems to me that we could easily bump up the Cape Flora by another 10% if we start looking hard. Um, just last week, Ishmael Ebrahim, who runs the, the uh, crew program for the Threatened Species Program of Sandby, discovered a brand new, really showy Marea uh, standing out there in broad daylight. Um, but the other thing that makes our flora so incredibly remarkable in the Cape especially, but uh, also incredibly challenging to conserve, isn't just that diversity, but the unbelievable levels of endemism. I mean, we've got these ridiculous, stupid plants that uh, decide to live on a couple of square kilometers. Um, and if that habitat goes, they're gone. Um, so it's, it's, it's both wondrous and incredibly frustrating. And I believe we, we've also finding new relationships between plants and animals. A few years ago, a lizard that is a pollinator in the fane bars. Hmm. Yeah. Susie? Yes, so, and on top of all that plant and animal diversity, and, and William has really described it really well, there's such a wealth of different evolutionary history, such a wealth of physiognomy and structure, but also ecological dynamic. And on top of that, we have, and I think this is only becoming realized or prominent more recently, an incredible wealth of biocultural diversity because all these different parts of the country also had different local indigenous peoples interacting with that biodiversity. So knowledge of medicinal plants, um, things that are considered sacred, you know, all that indigenous knowledge and practice is incredibly diverse across South Africa. And as you pointed out with your fact that some 70 odd percent of people still make use of medicinal, traditional medicinal plants, um, all these other facets, the more traditional practices and knowledge, even in our very modernized society, are alive and well if you bother to look. And I think that is also of very special about South Africa. I recently completed some research on the use of plants for making indigenous fishing um, tackle and fishing baskets and so on uh, in, in Africa. And I've also included in that uh, uh, plants that are used as natural fish poisons. And it's quite extraordinary. I mean, we're dealing with hundreds and hundreds of species of plants that are used in those ways. All right, well, we can come back to diversity during the discussion, but let's get on to the next question, which is key to our theme. And that is how important are botanical gardens in conserving this unique and fantastic plant diversity that we have in South Africa? Donovan, would you like to kick off? Sure, I think, um... I have some probably less mainstream ideas. Uh, I think the conservation community has done itself an enormous disservice by focusing too strongly on the utility value of plants uh, over the last couple of decades. You know, you look back in the 70s and everyone was uh, peace and love and uh, the age of Aquarius was dawning. Um, and we would still save natural systems for the sheer magnificent uh, love of them or spiritual value or whatever your personal uh, uh, stuff is. And we've, we've, especially in South Africa, made this very strong uh, financial value of plants uh, argument whenever we want to conserve. And I, I think there's definitely a value in that, but I think it's a mistake to overemphasize it. And I think part of that is that we also... Uh, snow people under with statistics and figures about transformation and loss and uh, the level of diversity and the change and all of these kind of things. Um, and for the average person, and it's been very interesting being at the interface of the public, uh, young learners, new university students, and my sort of scientific background and uh, training, 
and seeing this enormous mismatch between our understanding of the landscape as ecologists um, and the average person who, who might have some limited insight into diversity, but mostly sees the landscape as just green stuff. Um, and I think the biggest job for a botanic, for in any botanical garden um, is probably to be a purposeful storyteller um, and to make the connection between the abstract green stuff and the things that we can show them in front of them in a botanical garden and make these stories and these figures and these things real um, and not abstract um, to make them personal. And I think that's in many ways should be the primary job of almost every botanical garden. There's many, many, many things that botanical gardens can do, but for me, that's a, that's a big one. Um, and that obviously then encompasses also teaching and training and all sorts of things. But it's, it's for me, a big job is to make, to make that science and the abstraction that ecologists understand so well, real for the average person. So you're saying that one of their main conservation roles is actually developing that interface with the public and, and using stories and guided tours and so on, being able to inform them and hopefully improve their understanding of the value of plants and their importance. And, and to make them get hit in the gut when they see a figure like 10% habitat loss. Um, you know, we've got superb, superb environmental legislation, really, really good, fantastic policy. It's not being enforced. The latest, uh, I was involved in the 2018 National Biodiversity Assessment in a very uh, small way. Um, and what we know is that the most threatened habitats are still losing uh, habitat proportionally faster than the less threatened habitats. Um, all of the policy and the conservation maps and the plans and everything we said was that stuff essentially now is sacred. Um, it's off limits to development. You shouldn't get development approvals for it and you should be prosecuting people who illegally develop. And yet it's still being lost at a faster rate than other habitats. So clearly the, the numbers are not enough by themselves. And the laws. Okay, we have a question to you, Donovan, from um, Andrew Dix. Um, I can't read the whole thing, but is it important that the financial greed for development is overruled by a government decree via your efforts to protect certain areas? Um, I think that's a, a, a rather more challenging way of saying it than is strictly necessary. I would argue that um, conservation decision-making for land use is very much like tax. Government needs to make decisions that are not always in the best interests of an individual in order to do things that are in the best interests of society. Um, at the moment, unfortunately, uh, the, the system supports uh, commercial and economic development over uh, the broader good of sustaining a living landscape. Um, and the landscape is dying a death by a thousand cuts. I don't think it is just greed. I think there's a legitimate need for commercial development, for jobs, for all those good things. Um, but the balance, uh, unfortunately, when one makes decisions case by case, uh, the balance tends to fall on the wrong side of, of sustainability. So we need to go back to that strategy, that World Conservation Strategy statement of development as if nature matters. And we need to make sure that more people know that nature matters and that that is real to them. Any comments from you on the, the role of botanical gardens in conservation and awareness? Sorry, from me. Uh, Susie. Oh. Um, um, I think what is really amazing about botanical gardens is the intersection they are at between aesthetics and recreation and beauty, research and, you know, there's a whole lot of research and curation and data that also is collected and accumulated there, which a lot of the lay public often isn't aware of, as well as that whole education and then the 
conservation of an ex situ of um, endangered species. And then, of course, historically, a big role in horticulture and developing horticulture and even agriculture. So I can think of few institutions that have such a multifaceted role and 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 that in the same time can sort of capture the public's imagination mm. and love of plants. I think what it's about their role in pro promoting uh, citizen science. Because, mm. you know, if, if we look at the animal demography unit at UCT, the fantastic development of citizen science in terms of documenting the distribution of animals. And I believe they are doing some plant groups as well. Can botanical gardens play a, a big role in that? I know that there's, for example, climate change related research on plant phenology, where people observe, um, you know, the sort of timing of fruiting, flowering and leafing. And those observations accumulatively are apparently very informative of how different groups of plants respond to changing temperature, seasonality and so on. And, and it takes a lot of individuals making those observations and for them to be curated, for that to be possible. So that's one that's, of the that, types of citizen science that I'm aware of in botanical gardens in different parts of Citizen science is a very part, important part of the future scenario because there will never be enough scientists on the ground. Yeah. But let's go to oh, William. Yeah. William, your take on the, the role of botanical gardens? Well, let me just say on the citizen science that uh, the Protea Atlas project is one of the most successful citizen science projects ever anywhere. And uh, it actually was the model for developing other citizen science type projects all over the world. So uh, the botanical gardens in South Africa have led the way in citizen science um, projects. And I mean, another very important one is looking after threatened species and trying to evaluate and monitor them, where again, it was it's soon apparent that we just didn't have enough um, researchers, formal professional people to keep track and uh, brilliant innovative work to train and uh, encourage citizen scientists who are now passionate and excellent in going along and keeping track of what is going on. So I think uh, our botanical garden network has been phenomenal in the way it has developed citizen science. Uh, very interesting things too on plant phenology, trying to understand the uh, the seasonal variation, what plants are up to, which um, can contribute to an understanding of how global change, global warming is influencing the timing of events. And you can see that um, if the timing gets mis, uh, mistimed, if pollinators emerge but the flowers aren't there and so on, things can go severely wrong. So there are lots of uh, ways in which uh, citizens can join in and uh, get a lot of enjoyment with uh, fellow enthusiasts and contribute very useful information. A remarkable project, a remarkable project I've learned about recently near the heart of Beerspurt Dam, where schools are have projects to culture the weevils that are being used to control the invasive floating plants on the heart of Beerspurt yeah. Dam. A wonderful yeah. example of that. Uh, Susie, I think you had your hand up. No, I was trying no. to squat on the Okay, Donovan, <laughs> did you have a comment on citizen science? Yes. Uh, so, uh, sort of arising out of uh, the protea atlas type process, uh, Sandby now uh, plays a fairly significant role in um, supporting and coordinating the local iNaturalist community that is probably the most active citizen science uh, plant and animal observation uh, platform uh, in, in South Africa. Um, and that interfaces beautifully with the uh, custodians of rare and endangered wildflower uh, volunteerism program in Sandby that William was referring to, um, and also has phenomenally expanded our um, knowledge of the distribution and occurrence of plants. I was pretty skeptical 10 years ago uh, about the value of citizen science, but it's really 
become this incredibly useful network to know where our biodiversity is, what's going on with it, and also uh, to specifically focus on where rare and threatened species are. Yeah, we have a question from Zimkita Lignani, from Yana, who is responsible for championing citizen science? Is it the scientists, the media students, in terms of career framework? Well, I, I don't think there's any one organization, but one could start by looking at the website of the Animal Demography Unit at UCT, uh, the, the National Botanical Gardens. Does anyone else have a, a lead um, as to who, who the champions of citizen science are? Well, Sandy, Sandy does have an active uh, role in pushing the, the, so the Threatened Species Program has an active um, uh, uh, citizen science outreach arm, um, which specifically monitors uh, rare and threatened species. And they also encourage people to use iNaturalist. And as far as I know, most botanical gardens in the country would encourage people in their area to use uh, iNaturalist. So I think it's everyone's responsibility. And you mentioned SANBI, that's South African National Biodiversity Institute, based yes. at Kirstenbosch, which doesn't only deal with plants, but also with animals. Um, but yeah, they would be a very good place to start. And I think we've identified actually a very important role that the botanical gardens are playing in the modern world, the promoting of citizen science. It's worth noting that Sandby uh, run all of the national botanical gardens. So there is a garden in Joburg, there's one in the Low Felt, uh, I'm trying to remember where they all are, but there's multiple botanical gardens. Um, and they have a massive scientific program in addition to running the National Botanical Gardens um, and also engage with policy and legislation. Right, well, I, my next question actually builds on this and that is which advanced technologies can be applied to plant conservation in botanical gardens and beyond? Which advanced technologies can be applied? Um, Susie? Um, I'm probably not the best person to ask, but um, there's a, a lot of scramble to preserve genetic resources. So seed biology and ways of conserving plant germplasm into perpetuity or for as long as possible. I think that is probably a big technological area. And then I think also the sort of information technology side of it just as William pointed out, there's massive amounts of data, whether it's from satellites, whether it's from networks of scientists, whether it's ge you know, genetic information and so on. And to keep track of all that and make it useful and available, I think that's probably another huge technological area, which I know doesn't necessarily deal with the physical plant, but I think that is really important for making data useful and available. Okay, just to pick up on a comment, um, the Custodians of Rare and Endangered Wildflowers, CREW, has been running for almost two decades to survey plants of conservation concern. Just under 1,000 citizen scientists are involved with this CREW program. Okay, um, what about drones? How important are drones becoming in plant mapping and, and, and conservation? Donovan? Um, I have no idea. I have heard of people <laughs> using them. Um, uh, I know that overseas, a lot of very inaccessible areas are being uh, better targeted, but I think that's a general, um, a general botanical exploration tool rather than botanical gardens specifically. Um, what I would probably pick up on is, is uh, following on from Susie's uh, seed biology issues is certainly agreeing with that. Um, a lot of the base, one, one shouldn't forget that a lot of the really important stuff for conservation is also really simple and perhaps not always uh, uh, nature journal uh, worthy. Um, but there's also a, a huge explosion globally in um, use of uh, micropropagation and tissue culture. So sterile, effectively sterile culture of, of plants for propagation. Um, and uh, these techniques can be relatively simple or, or mind-bendingly difficult depending on what you're trying to do. Um, but they offer an opportunity to, in a relatively small space, quite rapidly take 
a diverse gene stock and bulk it up into thousands and thousands of plants for for uh, restoration or rehab or putting out back in the in the wild or maintaining in an exit you collection so there have been uh, I think fairly rapid growth in that area globally and I think South Africa is still uh, a little behind the curve on that particular bit William, you're very, tech, very well. you're very tech savvy, William. What's your take on the um, modern technologies that can be introduced into plant conservation? Well, it goes from the um, atomic level. You know, it, it goes from um, molecular biology, which has particularly blossomed in South Africa for trying to understand evolutionary history of different lineages. And that's been remarkably informative in a, in a country where we don't have much uh, fossil evidence for particular periods of time. Um, it's been useful, but there I would be, it'd be, it's quite useful for exploring why plants do what they do. It's uh, been quite useful for uh, the tissue culture side of things, but there we forget the molecules. There are uh, ingenious um, attempts in South Africa to propagate things, plants using tissue culture. Right at the other end, we have uh, significant progress being made in remote sensing from satellites to keep track of um, patches of land that are being transformed it's a very difficult country to monitor. So in the Cape Mountains, for example, we know we try to extract water, um, groundwater from those mountains, but we also know that there are a whole group of organisms, of plants and animals, very sensitive and dependent on groundwater. How on earth do you monitor these patches? And uh, recently, satellite-based methods have been developed that allow us to do this. So there's an array of really uh, interesting developments using technology, including analysis of really large data sets. I've been uh -huh. writing recently about a company in Cape Town called Aerobotics, who use drones to monitor plant health in horticulture and agriculture uh, by monitoring, for instance, leaf color. And they've gone from monitoring sort of fields of plants to individual plants and now even going down to individual leaves. It's quite phenomenal what they're doing. And then on, on a more bizarre level, um, this is still conceptual. In Japan, apparently they're developing mini um, drones the size of bumblebees, which they're planning to use to pollinate flowers in, in, um, in, in fruit, the fruit growing industry. Well, it might, it might be worth pointing out that uh, I discovered a wonderful technological advance in pollination recently. Eyelash extension brushes are the best thing for hand pollinating plants. They're very little. They do the job just perfectly. So there's a wonderful technological advance. Shipped straight out from China, AliExpress. So you don't have to go through the embarrassing exercise of going to a shop to buy an eyelash um, brush. <laughs> the wonders of internet purchasing. <laughs> okay, great. Right, well, let's look more broadly at the botanical gardens. I know it's essentially a financial issue, but if finances weren't a problem, to what extent would we need to extend the, uh, the uh, number of botanical gardens and the vegetation zones that they cover for them to be really effective in South Africa in conservation, management, and education? Are there huge gaps? Hmm. Donovan? Um, yes, uh, it would have to be uh, both in terms of the exit to conservation measures. Um, I, for example, think that uh, even uh, the Cape Flats could do with its own botanical garden. Kirstenbosch doesn't do a brilliant job, for example, of even uh, representing uh, the, the habitats of the Cape Peninsula very well. Um, and, uh, you know, if there's space right next to Kirstenbosch for another botanical garden, imagine what it must be like 
countrywide. Uh, but I, I feel a little like that's a, a almost a question, a, a string that, that has no end. Um, one can perhaps better focus and say what, with the resources we have available, what can we actually achieve? Um, and if we look at the number of uh, immediately threatened taxa uh, within just the Cape Flora, I think something like 40% of the Cape Flora is in one of the categories of conservation concern. I see the, the threatened species crowd are, are listening in, so they can correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, but we have literally hundreds of species that are at immediate risk of extinction. There was recently a, um, a paper done which, which claimed that uh, Hawaii was the world leader in extinctions. And I think the only reason that uh, answer came out is because they didn't look properly at our South African data. Um, and it would take enormous resources to effectively uh, target uh, ex situ growing of, a, of that many species and then to still do what many uh, northern hemisphere gardens do, which is get significantly involved in landscape uh, restoration and replanting. Um, so it would take uh, a tremendous amount for botanical gardens to address those kind of things. And I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the only really long term secure biodiversity conservation answer is happy, secure habitat. Um, and we should be aiming for that first and foremost. Uh, and that would be a far better investment for most of that money than making a plethora of botanical gardens. Okay, I think in terms of the marine environment, through the work of Kerry Sink at Sandby and others, I think 28 new marine protected areas have recently been proclaimed. But I think that's a lot easier to do out at sea where land, you know, the, it's not privately owned. What, what is the potential for developing uh, or further developing relationships with private landowners? Uh, and I'm thinking particularly of the, in the succulent Karoo, you know, who have very valuable vegetation zones on their properties, um, but it's impractical to, you know, create them as formal protected areas. Are there existing relationships that are, are useful in that regard? Um. A very good, can... very good example is uh, Renosterfeld, where um, it's highly fragmented and species are associated with tiny little remnants, um, which are too small for official protected areas. But where if you can get the farmers on your side, they are very happy and thrilled to set some famous, some Renosterfeld aside and to manage it. Um, I think again, South Africa has done very well there in, in developing partnerships with, with uh, land users, land managers. And uh, it's not only the commercial farmers. In, in, in um, Venda, you can come across remarkable little islands of protected habitat uh, of unusual species like Maletia swilmanii or Brachynrhigia zanzibarica. And uh, these have been preserved as sacred forest patches, uh, despite incredible pressure around them. So we have, we have the basis for um, local management of small and important isolated populations. And I think we should, we should continue with them. Uh, before I come to you, Donovan, I, we have a relevant question from Glenn Allard. Um, we mentioned that increase the species list by 10% if we did more work and increase our coverage. Most of our biodiversity estate is held in private lands. What mechanisms need to be available to access, monitor these areas, considering the fine scale endemism of the CFR? Um, Whoever asked that question, one suspects would have some good answers. <laughs> Now, perhaps our chat box should also be for answers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think we have, have actually touched on that. And in, in, in that, you know, for instance, William has mentioned that there are many, both commercial and small scale farmers who are really contributing significantly. Does this relationship need to be formalized further? Is there any benefit in that? Um, 
so uh, that this is area that I can actually speak to from my former professional life. Um, there is an active program of uh, private land stewardship throughout all of the country's uh, uh, conservation, uh, provincial conservation agencies. Um, and that typically involves uh, various levels of engagement with private landowners, but the top level of engagement actually being uh, formal title deed restrictions on a property uh, that prevent, it, prevent parts of it being developed, not necessarily the whole thing, that prevent designated bits being uh, transformed and include in, in many instances a formal management plan. And if those boxes are checked, those private properties are actually part of our protected area network. So they're declared protected areas in terms of our National uh, Environmental Management Act uh, the Protected Areas Act, um, and they contribute to our protected area state perfectly formally as if they were managed by a nature conservation agency. So there's there's not just a, a mechanism for it. It's been happening for some 20 years already. Um, but again, the big challenges, um, and especially I think this year with COVID uh, and with competing priorities, is that it's cheaper than buying land and sticking it in a conventional protected area but it's not free. And those resources are still under enormous pressure throughout the country. Yeah. Um, Sidi, I want to ask your opinion, but uh, first I'd like to read a comment from Sivana uh, Mohan. WWFSA is championing fantastic work to increase protected areas in the succulent guru biome by the biodiversity stewardship process. So anyone who wants to follow up on that, go on to the WWFSA um, website. See the, your take on the importance of, of private land ownership uh, as stewards of biodiversity? It's absolutely crucial. There's no way we can spread our protected areas to cover everywhere that we have biodiversity because of that incredible spatial turnover and the endemism. And as William has said, We've got some really groundbreaking work going back 20 years or even more. The Botanical Society used to do amazing stuff. And um, there's, you know, South African workers have also been at the forefront of systematic conservation planning, um, identifying these mega conservancy networks that include formal protected areas. When the figures of threats and so on, I think it needs to be all hands on deck. Uh, what about the role of tribal authorities? Uh, when I lived up in, in northern Zululand, in Maputland, on the shores of Lake Sabaya, we were nestled within the coastal dune forest, and large swathes of that were protected by the local people in the villages, uh, for instance, of Mabibi and others. And, uh, you know, they were quite ferocious in the way they protected those areas and wouldn't allow them to be destroyed. How important is this, uh, Donovan, in South Africa? Um, I, I am not that in touch with what's happening lately, but I do know that uh, I happen to be married to someone who is working for Conservation South Africa, which is the, the South African arm of Conservation International. Um, and one of the uh, sort of landscape programs they work with is to engage with uh, communal landowners in various parts of the country, including uh, the Eastern Cape, uh, and they've got formal agreements in place uh, where uh, communally owned so-called tribal lands have been formally designated as, as protected or with at least management plans to ensure that both the biodiversity and the, the um, ecosystem values of that landscape are conserved. So it's, it's definitely happening and it's definitely important. It's more challenging always because there's there's many more role players on any particular place, um, uh, and it tends to be more successful where there's still a strong uh, leadership structure. Uh, but it's definitely viable and happening. Um, so uh, I think, as as Susie said, all hands on deck, everything and everywhere uh, is needed in order to get our landscape adequately protected. Now, are we doing enough to capture? the uh, traditional knowledge of plants and, and their, their uses. I know centers of excellence have been established at at least three universities in South Africa that I know, probably more. 
Uh, but, you know, is there a broader role that different people can play? William, do you have any take on that? Well, it's, uh, I've been most impressed with the way um, capture information has, people have recognized that the holders of that information are often the oldest people and they, they, they're going, they're being lost. And uh, huge efforts are being made to try and capture as much information as one can as quickly as possible. And I'm glad that that's been recognized um, and I, I don't know enough about how well it's proceeding, but I was struck at, um, uh, for example, Ben Eric van Weyck and University of Johannesburg's efforts to capture the information in the Northern Cape. Um, so again, you know, you've got to be impressed with uh, South Africa recognizing it as an issue and trying to step in and do something. To link that more closely with botanical gardens would be would be interesting. I mean, one of the things that uh, I found remarkable, um, the book on wildflowers of KZN, none of us knew, well, when I say none of us, the, the ecologists didn't know those wildflowers. They were, they were, as some people put it, on crate capensis, meaning cape weeds. Um, but, you know, for more than two and a half thousand species illustrated in that wildflowers of Natal, there were Zulu names, independent Zulu names. Each plant, each herb was recognized as having sufficient value to give it a name. That's phenomenal. That's phenomenal. So who's using them? For what purposes? Why? What is their value? Uh, of course, there's, there's oceans more that should be done. A gem of a book on, on plants is Marjorie Courtney Latimer's uh, book from the 60s on the flowering plants of the Tsitsikama coast. And in that, she incorporates not only, you know, the usual information about plants, but her vast knowledge uh, of the traditional uh, uses of plants and, and, and the, the values that, that Indigenous people put on them. And, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot to be said for that. Susie? Um, I think we haven't done too badly in documenting, extracting, and so on. I, I can't remember the word that you used, but I think where we also need to maybe move more strongly and maybe take a leaf out of the books in places like Latin America and other continents is not just us documenting and extracting from them, but actually to engage more genuinely and and to also kind of empower people who live in these areas to, you know, have a greater awareness of their power to protect their natural heritage. You know, we have got amazing EIA legislation, middle class people like us who are nature lovers and familiar with that jump up and down when nature is threatened. But I mean, look at the battles, for example, on the wild coast um, about dune mining and so on. And I think just the sort of empowerment and the awareness that you can articulate the values that you attach to nature as a community, as an individual, and that that actually has got legal weight. Um, I think we still have to come quite a long way in that respect. And to also just gain a better appreciation for how different groups of our South African society appreciate, interact with nature and not just this. It's, I think it's been very strongly biased towards extracting knowledge about medicinal plants, for example, that has potential commercial value. And I don't think as much has been done to really try and understand how most of South Africa's people engage with and value nature. And I think that's actually really important. I think you've made some very important points there. And as has repeatedly come up in our discussion, South Africa is really a world leader in many, many fields uh, of plant sciences. I think, for instance, uh, I think it's called the Nagoya Protocol, which recognizes the value of indigenous knowledge um, in, in plants. You know, we were a signatory to that, and we're one of the countries that's apparently implementing it to the greatest extent. Donovan? Um, yeah, I just I think it's also worth picking up on Susie's point that botanical gardens have this, I mean, we referred to this earlier, this, this incredible uh, romantic brand value. Um, as this sort of interface with 
uh, beauty and collecting and old, old stuff and gardens and all the rest. But in some ways, it's also a very much a Victorian Northern Hemisphere plant collector uh, heritage. Um, and there is a very big challenge for us to also make, make our gardens relevant to the broad cross-section of, of South African botany. And I think, I mean, you would have all seen the, the, the recent brouhaha's around um, reasons for there being uh, a lower representation of black botanists uh, in our community. Um, and uh, some very silly ideas put forward for why that was. Uh, but I do think it's one of the great challenges of botanical gardens is to uh, be more uh, welcoming, more accessible, more relevant, uh, more generally exciting for everyone in South Africa, um, including talking to all of these points that we've just covered. Um, and yeah, we, we are still away from that. It's still very much a, um, in some ways, a, a, a middle-class white uh, um, resource. And that, that needs to change and it needs to change quite fast, I think. Well, that, that's actually, a watch, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have been to all the other botanical gardens. <laughs> well, you go to, you go to uh, Kirstenbosch on the day when the bus is working and bringing in all the people from the flats. It's wonderful and everyone loves it. Enjoying it. No, no, we, we do. We do fortunately also have a balanced demographic of visitors, but I do think that our uh, content is still very much mired in a uh, historical um, uh, uh, context. Uh, you know, I've got to argue with you. The, uh, the classic example is Cameroon, where, they, where the botanical gardens were the beginnings of a turnaround and the end the beginnings of rebuilding the society. Gardens are gardens, trees, greenery. Doesn't matter who you are, what you are, you enjoy them. It just has to be accessible financially Absolutely. and in terms of transport. And because of apartheid transport structures, you need to, do, to pull your finger to try and get the people there. But uh, I don't think it's, uh, whatever Victorian thing it was, thank heaven, because it's given us this legacy of 10 superb botanical gardens scattered across the country, which all of us are enjoying. So let's celebrate in fact, that. In fact, across the, the continent, I recently visited Accra and the University of Ghana, and it's situated in a giant botanical garden. The whole campus is effectively a botanical garden, and it's a wonderful resource. But that yeah. leads me to the next question, and that is how can we further ensure the the the, the long-term viability um, of our botanical gardens. What, what do we need to do? Susie, do you have any comment? Well, from the apart from the obvious need for continued funding, I mean, I think the educational role, I mean, we are, you know, they are important for agriculture, for horticulture, for climate change research and so on. And I think that is a tremendous value that can be accessed through collaborations with research institutions and so on. I think, you know, people will expect them to sort of prove their worth. And I guess they will continue to do it, need to continue to do it on all fronts, the inspiration and leisure, the research and the conservation fronts. And then hopefully that value will continue to justify the continued support. Do we sell them well enough to the authorities, to the funders, to the private sector? Uh, do, are, are people generally aware of the incredibly valuable role that they're playing, Donovan? Um, I, th I think they are. Um, botanical gardens are expensive to run. Uh, don't, uh, even, even a very, very little one like ours is, is not a cheap exercise. Um, and I think first and foremost, if we want to support and sustain botanical gardens, the, the crucial thing is to use them. Public to come and visit, the scientists to try and see how they can use our resources. So I think one of the things that, that we've found is that uh, uh, even on the doorstep of a university, the academics tend to forget that we're there and we're available and we've got things that they could use for teaching or research or 
whatever the case may be, or, or that if we don't have them, we would generally be very happy to uh, engage and hold them, hold collections that are relevant for research or for teaching or whatever the case may be. So for me, the, the starting point of making botanical gardens sustainable is to demonstrate that they're valuable to use them for everyone, whoever, whoever the, the stakeholder might be. William? I think we need more movies. Um, the, just to point out that uh, relying on government to support botanical gardens um, leads to impoverishment. And uh, the, the growth, the enormous growth that we saw in the botanical gardens in the 1990s was a conscious effort by the then director, Brian Huntley, to attract other sources of funding from all over the place, including the summer concerts, um, the donors, um, it became making the Strelitzio and calling it Mandela's gold. You know, all of these uh, being entrepreneurial, being businesslike about botanic gardens. Um, and then to add, I think we need more movies uh, to, you know, the, the, a year at Q hit the screens of thousands and thousands of people. So everyone went to watch what was going on in Q. Um, how much more interesting to have what's going on in the low Lofar Botanic Gardens or something like that, you know? Let's, um, let's produce something that's accessible to many, many people where we do celebrate our gardens and, and our nature. Yeah. Donovan, I'll come to you. Susie, any comment on how we can market our botanical gardens better? I think William is spot on with the movies. I think that it needs to be really public. Um, and I mean, just the recent Netflix hit my octopus teacher, you know, suddenly everybody wants to be in the kelp forest. I think that is, oh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and as Donovan had said, you know, bring people in, make them use them and so on. But, and I guess social media. Donovan? So, we do, you've suddenly gone all quiet. We do use social media quite a lot, um, but uh, bear in mind that uh, every botanical garden is, is very human resource limited. And I think uh, I speak both for myself and my colleagues at Sandby is that if we had to produce a movie on top of what we do now, uh, we're all gonna have heart attacks. Um, but uh, one thing that's also worth bearing in mind is that the Cape flora, well, the South African flora actually, has contributed disproportionately to the global horticultural trade. And that trade is worth hundreds of billions of dollars a year. Um, and there's still a huge amount of potential in our flora that hasn't been uh, explored. And we haven't looked at ways to extract value from that flora that's been taken overseas since the 1600s. Um, so if you think of something like uh, a relatively, uh, what you would think is a relatively minor plant, um, just freezes 400, I think the figure was, was it 4 million, 400 million cut stems per annum just in Holland alone. Um, now you multiply that with garden plants and cut flowers and all the other things coming out of South Africa. Our contribution is in the billions. And even if we skimmed a fraction of 1% of that somehow, that's an awful lot of money that would be flowing back into South African biodiversity. Oh, that's um, a very interesting point. Well, we're, we're actually over our time. The hour has flown past, but I'd like to ask each of the panelists to perhaps make a, a concluding comment um, on plant diversity, conservation, botanical gardens. William? I think that uh, botanical gardens is, is a fantastic, uh, our, our botanical gardens in South Africa are a fantastic legacy and uh, we need to um, enjoy them and celebrate them, allow them to grow. They have, uh, what we haven't talked about is the science that they've supported. And that science has been very important in documenting uh, the diversity of the country in tracking its changes and then exploring its physiology and ecology. So uh, we really need to continue. Um, 
And if the fish guys follow us in our brilliant achievements, you'll be doing well, <laughs> Mike. <laughs> yeah, I, I, in fact, had several questions about research, which we simply haven't got, had time to get into. And also, for instance, the importance of controlling invasive plants, the importance of conserving pollinators, the importance of water conservation. You know, all of these are issues that have been addressed and perhaps need to be addressed more in the future. Susie, your concluding comment? Well, I concur with William about just the need to be aware and celebrate. Um, I mean, having just flicked through the different botanical gardens while getting ready for this talk, I just want to go back to Harold Porter and swim in those rock pools. But it is also this massive contribution to science. And I think, I guess maybe to strengthen the links or to continue to build the links between what botanical gardens can contribute versus what sand parks and the provincial protected areas networks can contribute, the research institutions. I mean, the botanical gardens are quite underappreciated and yet they are so pivotal and for their small spatial extent, they actually contribute a massive amount. Yeah, I think that's something that's come out of our discussion, their disproportionate contribution despite their relatively small size. And the incredibly long history as well. Yes, absolutely. Donovan? Yes, I think I would just pick up on that. You know, the, the most support your local botanical garden wherever it is. Go and visit it, enjoy it, um, engage with it in positive ways. But it, it is, I mean, that is, I think, the apart from, as I was saying, making the abstract personal, one of the huge values is that we are at this nexus of different uh, um, uh, fields, and we can play a very synergistic role, uh, very uh, useful in terms of linking up uh, disparate uh, uh, groups of um, stakeholders. Um, and I think people should bear botanical gardens in mind, whoever they are uh, in the biodiversity sector, because they are a, a useful um, uh, linking point for many, for many people. Well, there's so many things we haven't covered. I'd hope we'd have time to discuss the effect of climate change on vegetation zones, whether climate change is impacting on the, the usefulness of our botanical gardens. But I'm afraid we've run out of time. So I'd like to thank our three panelists, uh, Susie Donovan and William, very much for their time and for sharing their knowledge. Uh, thank all our viewers for attending the webinar and sending in your questions. I've certainly learned a lot and I hope that you have as well. Please everyone continue to support SciFest events right through the summer and keep safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you.